Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Malbus. I'm Head of External Affairs at the Oxford Internet Institute. It's a pleasure to see you all uh, today. Welcome to Digital Identity Systems Lessons from Kenya. Um, it's a webinar from the Oxford Internet Institute in partnership with the Nubian Rights Forum. Um, we're delighted to have uh, a great panel today featuring Dr. Keegan McBride, Dr. Anna Valdivia, uh, Mr. Mustafa Mahmoud and Ms. Laurie Rousey. Um, to evaluate the regulatory frameworks for privacy and data protection, examine the role of digital identification in improving inclusivity and the challenges that must be addressed, and analyze the impact of digital identity systems on service delivery and efficiency in various sectors, and of course with a, a Kenyan context in, in running through much of this. Uh, I'll just introduce uh, our speakers. So we have Dr. Keegan McBride, he is a departmental research lecturer at the OII and the program leader for the master's program in the social science of the internet. His research generates insights into the state and the digital age uh, by exploring interactions between technology society and the state. Dr. Anna Valdivia is a departmental research lecturer at the OII and is a critical AI scholar her research explores how datafication and algorithmic governance shape social, economic, and political worlds with a focus on technology, migration, and gender. Mustafa Mahmoud is co-director of the Citizenship Program at Namati. He has supported partner organizations working with community-based paralegals on citizenship rights, inclusion, and statelessness in Kenya, Bangladesh, Jordan, and Myanmar. He was previously the program manager at the Nubian Rights Forum, where he managed a team of seven paralegals assisting the Nubian ethnic minority in applying for citizenship documents. Laurie Rousey is the data protection lead at Oxfam and the founder of Data Rights. We're proud that Laurie is an alumna of the OII and our master's program, and we're grateful for her to, for introducing us to the work of the Nubian Rights Forum and the, the context uh, of Kenya. Um, her areas of focus uh, are strategic litigation, dual use tech governance, cybersecurity, competition, public private partnerships, and humanitarian data. Um, we also have on the call Yasa Musa, who is a uh, project manager and paralegal with the Nubian Rights Forum, and Maseki Rioba, who is a communications consultant and is uh, also um, affiliated with the Nubian Rights Forum. The webinar will run for uh, around two hours, including uh, discussion and Q&A at the end. So um, feel free to, to take breaks um, as you wish during that time. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A box and, and please feel free to do so at any point during the discussion and we'll try and address them as we go. Um, and just for your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website um, following the event. Um, I think we're going to uh, start with um, hearing from uh, Mustafa Mahmoud, um, but I'm, I'm conscious he is just um, moving uh, from, his, uh, uh, from his, his mobile to his laptop. So um, I just wanted to uh, see if uh, any of our other speakers just wanted to um, maybe just say a few words about the um, perhaps um, Yasa or Maseki could maybe just say a few words about the uh, and start us off talking about the, the sort of the Kenyan context here and, and kind of why we're framing this discussion in this way today. My apologies, I'm just get, getting through security. Um, and uh, just a minute. <laughs> Would that be okay, um, Yasa or Maseki, perhaps to just talk a, a little bit about the... Um, thank you so much, uh, Mark. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody. As uh, Mark has said, my name is Yasa, the project manager of the New Human Rights Forum. Um, just a brief um, statement about the issues of a digital platform. Nubian Rights Forum, we've been working with the Nubian community to help them um, apply for documentation on that is a uh, birth certificate, identification cards, passport, and also driving licenses. Um, this has been our main um, 
agenda, our main aim to just make sure that the Nubian community are registered and are not at risk of becoming stateless because the stateless communities have been facing discrimination on access to these documents. And if you are a stateless community, you cannot be able to, um, or if you do not have identification card, you cannot be able to register for bank account, you can't register for schools, you can't even get uh, access to scholarship or even travel abroad for opportunities. So based on this, we've been working with um, partners across the nation and um, other organizations across the world to just help the community understand uh, the importance of nationality through the use of legal empowerment, whereby we impact the knowledge to the community because we believe it is important for the community to spearhead and push forward for government to recognize them and government to give them nationality for them to also access services. So I wouldn't want to speak more if Mustafa is ready, probably we can wait for him to prepare so that we can continue with the case. But in 2019, I can say we um, the Kenyan government launched a national identity management system, which is known as Huduma Number or NIMS. And this NIMS was meant to be a source, uh, a single source of truth, whereby after you are issued with this documentation, it is the document that will um will be used to know you for the rest of your time. But um, when you look at the Kenyan government, the procedure and the processes that were followed are not the same that we as civil societies and other actors wanted. Um, one of the things that we wanted at least is for the Kenyan government to make sure that before they launch the Uduma number, they make sure that they register all discriminated communities, all the communities that do not have access to, to documentation, they are issued with these documents. Because when you look at Huduma number, for you to register for this digital platform, you needed at least four types of documents, either driving license, passport, identification card, or um, birth certificate. But this is the document that the Nubian community and other discriminated communities do not have. So this meant that if you did not have this document, you are be you will be locked out of um, getting access to services. So based on this, probably that's when we decided to work as a team of um, civil societies. And I would let Mustafa speak more about it. That's when we went to court to just challenge the digital platform. So I think uh, Mustafa can uh, give um, a wider context on how we went to court, the results and everything. Then from, from there, we can be able to pick it up from there. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, my apologies. I've, uh, I have a series of meetings. I've just gotten out of another meeting on identity also. Um, my, my session is about, uh, I'm supposed to take you guys uh, through um, digital identity and inclusion in Kenya. Um, in Kenya, we are currently having the second generation identity uh, cards. Um, we call it second generation because they are digitally printed but they're not um, as smart. When I talk about smart, I, I'm talking about machine readable identity cards. So um, this was uh, introduced in the early 90s and um, they phased out the ones that were written, handwritten uh, and uh, glued uh, and the photo was glued to the card. So um, in 2019, there was a new identity regime which you refer to as Huduma number or National Integrated Identity Management System that was being introduced uh, to amalgamate all the registers. So um, right now we have, um, we have the civil uh, registry that does civil and vital uh, statistics, uh, that is birth and death registration. We have um, NRB or National Registration Bureau that does uh, the registration of all adults. Um, 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 that has uh, the registration of all adults above the age of 18. And then we have immigration, which offers um, citizenship by registration and also all uh, immigration issues like uh, registration of, um, of expatriates and, the, uh, and also uh, passport services. So with the NIMS, it was supposed to consolidate all registers um, that uh, they wanted to develop what we call a single source of truth um, for maybe companies, uh, the corporates could be able to 
use this single source of truth uh, to be able to, um, to know their customers um, and just basically doing uh, KYCs on their side. So um, when this was being uh, launched in 2019, uh, civil societies had issues with it because um, uh, first and foremost, there was it lacked aspects of public participation because um, the whole uh, the whole uh, system was launched on a miscellaneous amendment act, uh, so it didn't require public participation. Um, why is public participation important? It's because our civil registration is anchored on a law that was uh, passed in 1904 before Kenya got independence. The NRB or the ID registration was, is anchored on a law that was passed in 1947, still before Kenya got independence. Now, when you're bringing a system that is going to, um, to overthrow all these other systems, and it's going to last us, uh, if you see, uh, if the first uh, one was 1902, the second one 1947, uh, the second uh, regime uh, 1947, um, then ask yourself, when is the next time that you're going to amend such laws? So it is very important for us to be able to have public participation on things that are of national importance. So that is one of the reasons as to why people went to court. But apart from that, um, we have a, a regime that basically allows the registrar of persons or the person issuing the document to have the sole discretion to ask you for any document that that person might deem necessary. So this uh, develops a problem of um, unweighted uh, discretion whereby someone could ask you, you're applying for an ID card or an identity card, and they, could, they have the discretion to ask you for a title deed for land, um, to ask you to go and bring your parents, which basically um, it goes against the constitutional principle of non-discrimination, and it's a violation of human rights uh, because the constitution says no one should be discriminated upon directly or indirectly. So how does this manifest? Um, when you we look at the context um, in Kenya, uh, when you turn 18, you're supposed to go to the nearest registration center. Unfortunately for communities that are deemed as border communities, uh, for lack of better words, um, or uh, national security threats, um, they have to go through what we call vetting. Vetting is a rigorous uh, process whereby you have to appear in front of a panel that uh, you go and prove to them your nationality. Um, but why is this uh, discrimination uh, discriminatory? First and foremost, um, Kenya is a Jusanguine uh, state. So your nationality is through blood. But um, how do you prove blood? You should prove blood by either your birth certificate um, that shows the name of your parent who's a Kenyan. But unfortunately, the birth certificate states that it is not proof of nationality. So when you reach 18, for other communities, you just appear with a copy of your birth certificate and a copy of your parents' ID card, and you apply on any given day. For communities that prescribe to uh, the Muslim faith in Kenya, um, of which uh, the Nubian community is part of it, um, when you turn 18, you can only go to the application center on uh, Tuesday and Thursday. Those are the days that um, the vetting elders sit there. Now, the vetting elders are Nubian elders that have to ascertain that you come from a lineage of Nubian um, people. So um, this does not happen for the other applicants. It only applies uh, for such uh, community. So um, you go, the elder asks you who's your grandfather, who's your great grandfather, who's your father, who's your mother and all those. And then he swears an affidavit on your behalf. Then he schedules you for a national vetting um, that takes between two to three months uh, to, uh, to empanel. And then when you go and sit in front of that panel, it has three quarter security organs um, in terms of composition. Uh, we have the OCPD officer in charge of the police department uh, that is uh, close. Um, uh, we have uh, national intelligence uh, services also sitting there. We have um, the chief who's a security organ we have the district, uh, the DCC, Deputy County Commissioner, who's also a security organ. So it's heavily securitized. So you find someone who's 18 sitting, uh, appearing in front of a panel of almost 14 people. First, he's intimidated. Secondly, he has to prove that he's a Kenyan. He doesn't even understand. He's just coming fresh from school. So why did we go to court? Uh, we, are we went to court because we wanted this first to be addressed because we have challenges accessing the current identity cards. 
And then you roll out a new identity regime that you require them to enroll in. But for them to enroll in, you require them to come with a current and foremost, we, uh, we thought um, this system will leave out these people. It will become another layer. It will be like a layer of onions. You peel this, you have another layer. So I, we felt like um, it will become another layer uh, of discrimination and these people will continue uh, to uh, be subjected to discrimination. So um, we, uh, as civil societies working on identity systems, we are talking about a comprehensive uh, overhaul of the identity system, uh, identity laws, um, and they are already drafts, but unfortunately the government went uh, the shortcut of just amending one section, uh, section nine, by putting subsection nine A. So by doing that, it, it, um, it undermined the entire process that civil societies were to, uh, taking in terms of having an inclusive identity regime. So yeah, um, well, the aspect of exclusion was very key in terms of um, the litigation. But the other thing that civil society were talking about is that that section nine A was talking about, uh, it also um, it talked about amalgamation of all identity registers. Today, um, I had the privilege of going to the civil registry and they were giving us a view, a view of the office and the system only offers two offices, but they complain about redundancy and how the systems hang and all that. So imagine if you're going to feed all the databases in one server, um, how much um, data can that server take in terms of uh, data protection mechanism? Uh, at that time, there was also no data protection um, laws. Um, uh, when we went to court, it's the time that now a data commissioner was appointed by the state. A data uh, protection act was passed by the state after lobbying for over three years, and it was not a priority. So um, the aspect of data protection came in, and also the aspect of uh, excessive collection of data, because one of the best practices of, um, of um, identity um, is data minimalization. So you only collect at the base entry, you collect a foundational data, uh, that is stored by one uh, entity, then the others just collect um, uh, data that they need to operate. So basically, um, when, there were, um, when we looked at the form, it was asking about your land holding, the number of wives you have, the number of children that you have, the number of livestock that you have. Like it was excessive data that does not concern issues of uh, identification. The other loophole that we had seen is that they also, um, when they were defining biometrics that can be collected, they were talking about DNA and also GPS coordinates. And to us, these were excessive data that we saw that it's a big risk that when this data gets into the wrong hand, um, someone uh, will lose everything because um, unlike theft, uh, you can have a legal redress in court. When your, digital, when your identity is stolen, it's done. What is the, how do you recover your identity when it's gone? So yeah, um, um, when the NIMS uh, or Huduma number was being launched, uh, the civil society had grievances that um, were connecting with the nation uh, in terms of data protection, in terms of excessive collection of data, uh, instead of them being minimalist in terms of only uh, practical data. Um, and also the aspect of commercialization, because the government had said that they uh, will be able to lease this information to any third party that they needed uh, the data. And one, during the public um, forums, in terms of one of the bills, um, the, uh, the permanent secretary for the ministry in charge said, uh, data is the new oil and uh, it's the new revolution. Just like that we had the, the industrial revolution, now we are having the data revolution. So we sh basically the, he was confirming that they are going to commercialize this data. And it was, it was worrying for us because uh, when you merge all the data together, there is a possibility of um, profiling. And this, uh, as much as people do not look at it in terms of security alone, there's the aspect of also corporates profiling. So for example, a practical case could be if you're going to apply for insurance, uh, medical insurance, um, when someone goes through your database, uh, your data and the database, they can see that um, you, had, <clears throat> you had been arrested on so, such and such date for um, illegal possession of uh, maybe uh, a weed, uh, or if not, you are um, driving drunk. But most of the times, as people who live in Kenya, we understand that sometimes because of the way you, you spoke to a policeman, he will write anything in the occurrence book and it will be used against you. So um, at the end of it all, when you're going to apply for an insurance, those records that you are not given the opportunity um, 
to appeal um, will, will haunt you because uh, there's a forum we were with one judge and he was saying he handles over 500 cases a day. And unfortunately, 70% of them because of either poor legal advice or no legal advice, they plead guilty to an offense that it could have been an easy argument for them out of it. So maybe they've been advised when you plead guilty, it's easier, you'll get maybe uh, to go and clean the road or something yeah. like that. And yet uh, it goes to the record. So you look at this and then later on, when these 300 people who pleaded to an offense that they were not sure of, uh, or maybe they just wanted it to be done, uh, when they're going to apply for medical insurance, when this information is run, they are uh, categorized as a liability because um, you are uh, arrested for this and that and that. So yeah, those are the concerns that we had. And uh, we were able to throw out uh, some of the things like uh, GPS, uh, DNA were thrown out. Uh, the, the courts also said that the government should have uh, a regulatory framework to make sure that there's inclusion and no ex exclusion uh, in the process. And also the other aspect was um, compulsion. I, I remember when this thing was being rolled out, people were being called and being coerced to go and apply for the document. If you don't ap uh, apply for this document, you will not get any services. And um, uh, the joke at that time is that if you don't apply, uh, it means you cannot be a Kenyan. So if I'm no longer Kenyan, where will I be deported to? And some people like Yasa had already selected that they wanted to go to Canada, uh, but unfortunately they were never deported. Uh, and I also didn't apply for the digital identity card. So the court said that it's optional. You cannot compel someone to enroll to a system. And I remember um, there was uh, online campaigns in terms of giving people information that it is not compulsory for you to enroll, um, asking the government, how are you going to use this data um, and all that. So yeah, um, now uh, the project was able to be stalled until the government tried to now reverse engineer. Um, they tried to bring a whole bill to uh, uh, to sanitize the process, but it was stalled. And now um, the beginning of the year around January, the new government that came into office around January, um, they, around uh, November last year, um, they now launched um, a new identity system that they are calling unique identity uh, personal identifier that they're saying that now they are the one to put unique identifier for a child from birth um the birth for example the what they call the birth entry number would be the one to you be used um for the rest of your life um until you die um and for this government it's not combative um they're trying to say what are the legal requirements that you have to meet? What are the public participation thresholds that we want to have? Like for example, right now they are thinking of having um, eight regional uh, public participation in eight regions. The other government, the other government just had one public participation in a remote area that you needed an Uber to get to or uh, take five public means to go to. So, um, so we are now having another uh, system that we are, they are calling unique personal identifier. So you see, um, it's, I just wanted to highlight that when you design an identify an identity uh, system, you need to have it public centered. You need to think uh, who's the end user. And most of the time, the end user for governments is usually the corporates that are buying the data. But that is also unfortunate. The end user should be the individual who you are, um, you're giving that identity card. But for governments, they treat these people as data subjects. And for us, when you talk about um, dig digital identity, um, most of the times government uh, misunderstands uh, merged registers and digital identity. So if we, the purpose of an identity is to be able to say that Mustafa, who claims is Mustafa Mahmoud, his image is this, his fingerprints are this, and he comes from area A, B, and C. Unfortunately, we go to the extremes to know this Mustafa more that now we breach his right to privacy. So there is a thin line between um, identif identification and profiling and also merging of databases. Because I don't know, uh, whoever sold um, the aspect to the previous government told them um, it's a must for them to merge register, for them to be able to be a digital register. Yet we have passports that are machine readable. So anyway, uh, I'd like to stop there by saying that um, from Kenya's, practice, uh, from Kenya's uh, experience, we've learned a lot that when you have an identity regime that is not people-centered, 
that there's no public participation in because this is something that will affect them for the rest of their lives. And for definition sake, the word huduma means service. So when you say that this is a huduma number, this is a service number, and then when you look at the bill that the government was trying to sanitize um, uh, the, the system with, it was even making it illegal to give any basic service to a person who does not have uh, a huduma number. In a country that we have over 2,000, over also almost over 20,000 people who are stateless that do not have any documents, and over 5 million people who are having challenges to get documentation. And you're saying that you're having a service uh, number that without that number, these people will not get even basic health care, basic education, and even the freedom to, uh, of movement. So yeah, that is the picture in terms of Kenya and context. Um, allow me to stop there. Thank you, Mustafa. That, that, that's really, really interesting stuff. Um, we had a, a question in the Q&A, and if anybody else wants to raise a question now, then, then please do, because I know Mustafa has to, has to, has to depart us soon. Um, but there's a question in the, the Q&A, Mustafa, about Ruto's new I, UPI proposal and its relationship to Mosip and Adha, and, Adha, and whether Russo, Ruto is looking to Pakistan or India as a model for digital identity. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, unfortunately, everybody is looking towards India for a model. Um, they forget that India also has made its own mistakes. Um, for this UPI, um, there are two phases of UPI. There's a phase of birth registration of which they've already piloted the past three months at government, at uh, private and government hospitals. Unfortunately, at government hospitals, it has failed because of connectivity and all that. Um, now, the UPI, according to uh, Ruto's plan, is that they are not looking at a legal framework. They're looking at a, um, a practice framework because they've always collected uh, what they call um, uh, birth entry number, that is the serial number on the birth uh, notification. So they are going to use that birth entry number as the point of entry uh, of registration. And that birth number, birth entry number is the one that the child will carry out for the rest of their lives. It is, it is kind of clear for kids, um, but unfortunately for adults, it's not yet clear because we have aspects of adults who um, don't have birth certificate um, they don't have identity cards. Uh, and also they are still grappling with the fact that they had collected data from Uduma number. Where does, uh, what do they do with this data? Uh, because they collected over 37 million people uh, as biometric. There is uh, a school of thought within the same government that uh, uh, the data was collected illegally. Um, how do they use it? Uh, others are saying the data has already been collected, money has been spent, we have to use it. Uh, civil society holds it that they should discard the data. So there are three school of thoughts that um, they are grappling with. But in terms of infrastructure, they are borrowing a lot in terms of um, Huduma, uh, in terms of um, um, other, uh, because everybody's learning from it. And since the other government had benchmarked using other, I don't think they're going to do any other benchmarking. So um, yeah, my point is um, we are copy pasting a lot. Um, and even today I was uh, telling them um, the Huduma number, when they were launching it, they were talking about it as an aspect that um, they had launched it in National Registration of Persons Act. Uh, it's an act that only governs the data of uh, adults above 18. And they collected also information for children. So when they are looking at UPI, when you're asking them about the legal framework, uh, we had to highlight that this was anchored on an act that basically only talked about adults. You're talking about children. We, are you going to do amendments to the birth and the death register? Are you going to have an amendment to the um, um, uh, Children's Act and all those? So it's not yet well thought, um, but this government is saying that we want to sit down. We want you to bring uh, your expertise to the table. So I think what they're doing better than the Indian context is that they are trying to bring the civil society to the table and asking them, um, how can we do this? Um, how do we do public participation? How do we have a power policy that is inclusive? And also they are even asking the, all the civil society, so, societies that have gone to court to sit down with their, their, their lawyers to be able to see, are there any policy reforms that they need to do? Are there any practice reform that they need to do? So I think that is the only distinction that it has with other. 
Thank you, um, thank you. And and uh, just while you were speaking there, uh, I, I should also say that UPI means un, uh, unique personal identifier. Um, I didn't know that till just now, so I thought there might be some on the call who didn't. Um, there's just a couple of questions um, which might also be um, uh, might others others on the panel might wish to comment. Um, the first is around Rwanda ratifying their digital IT bill and whether there are any important points to look at in terms of assessing compatibility with civil society and any red flags um, in, in looking at that bill. Um, perhaps Mustafa, that's one you know about, or maybe somebody else on the panel. Um, and then another, um, uh, another uh, attendee has said, um, why should we have all these identifications serving the same function? Why should the government release people's data when there is data see privacy agreements? That no one's data should be released without the individual's permission. And um, perhaps Mustafa, you might want to start on on those two, and then if anybody else on the panel uh, wants to to chime in, then feel free. Yeah, um, I'll begin with Dishan's question. Um, for for example, when you look at uh, the Huduma number registration, um, the consent that you gave was uh, consent during enrollment. Um, you didn't require any consent during the sharing of the data. And it was a generalized consent that I have given consent for my data to be collected and to be shared by any other agents of the government. So um, in the government's excuse, uh, that suffices as consent. But um, as people who work on issues of digital identity and uh, privacy rights, we know that consent should be two-sided at the point of enrollment and the point um, of, um, of uh, sharing the information. So that to us uh, was a loophole and it also helped us in terms of our case. Uh, that's the reason as to why um, um, there was the aspect of also the impact assessment that was not done in terms of if my information is uh, uh, is leaked, what is the repercussion? So, um, and also at what kind of information am I comfortable to share with? And that's the importance of public participation because if there was public participation, people could be able to say, I am not comfortable to share more than who I am. Because when you know, um, uh, when a corporate wants to identify a customer or what they call KYC, know your customer, um, they only need the basic information. Who am I? Uh, is this the photo that uh, I've given is correct? And the information that I've given is correct in terms of my name and my ID number. That is the most important thing they need. But when you have a lot of data that can be used uh, for profiling, that is, um, if it's leaked, it's very dangerous. And also, um, I, I'll shy away from uh, the um, uh, the Rwanda one because I've not read the, the act itself. I can't call it a best practice, um, but we have a data protection uh, act in place and we have a data commissioner in place. And the data commissioner has already developed a system in terms of uh, data impact assessment. And um, the, unfortunately the government uh, does not do it. But one of the things that we are trying to um, push the government because the government through the UPI, they're trying to digitize 5,000 services um, using UPI. So one of the things that we're trying to ask them is that, um, can you do an impact assessment for all the 5,000 um, services? Because uh, they, they've shown the goodwill. Um, and also in the working group, uh, the Office of the Data uh, Protection uh, Commissioner is also represented. So the conversations of doing an impact assessment is also on the table. So yeah, um, I, I don't know if I answered you, but uh, that could be my answer. Thank you, Laurie's got a hand up there. Hi, thank you for this question. Um, from the data protection uh, law angle in the European side, just to, just to add something, um, <clears throat> In the context of digital IDs, uh, we would actually not use the notion of consent, just to be very clear, uh, because your state has the right to, uh, has actually the duty to make sure that um, everything is functional in the society, and therefore your consent would not be uh, required, uh, should not be required, in fact, at least in Europe. Uh, what would be absolutely required would be thorough uh, information of individuals on uh, the risk assessments that were done, the mitigations that were implemented, uh, of course, the confirmation that uh, data minimization has been uh, infused in the system. Um, <clears throat> so all these aspects of public accountability. But just to be very clear, consent would not be followed in the European Union because 
you know, you can't say no to being able to access hospitals. That would not make sense. So just to be very clear in Europe, the notion of consent is not relevant on questions of IDs. Over. Thank you, Laurie, for that. And, and there's a couple of questions um, just for I'll, I'll direct towards Mustafa, because I know that he has to, to leave us um, shortly. Um, but there were two questions that were relevant, um, particularly um, to the Kenya example. Does the does the World Bank have a role in the in the new UPI, either as a funder or as a technical advisor? Or maybe does ID for Africa have a role? And also uh, we have an anonymous attendee asking um, what happens when one has gone through the vetting process to get an identity card when applying for a passport? They have to go through the same process, um, which is time consuming. Can this be addressed? And is this part of the conversation that, that you've had? So I'll begin with the anonymous. Uh, when you get vetted for an ID, um, when you go and apply for a passport, you'll be vetted again. And also when you uh, renew that passport, you'll be vetted again. Uh, when a child gets, uh, when you give birth to a child, even if he's one year old and needs a passport, that child will be vetted indirectly. Uh, so the government through the UPI initiative, they're promising that uh, they are planning to eliminate um, vetting through UPI so that um, the unique personal identifier will identify you and thus you don't need individuals to identify you. Um, the mechanisms of it is not yet clear because um, one of the things that we have seen as a challenge, even in the current uh, regime, um, is that when you digitize and uh, you have biases, you forget about other things. For example, the integrated population register, which came before Duma number, then because uh, we've had like this, uh, try, we've tried the several systems. One was the integrated population register that was supposed to develop a family tree. Uh, what they did, they used uh, a mother's um, identity card as the basis of registering all the children. In the defense, they say that um, it is hard for a mother to have two children within the same year, but it is easier for a father to have 10 children in the same year. So uh, it becomes easier to identify someone through the mother. So the challenge of this is that um, when you have a law uh, that now goes against the constitution because the constitution allows you to get nationality from either of the parents, um, you find that there are children who have been locked out of birth registration or have been registered as refugees because their mothers are refugees, but their fathers are Kenyans. In the real sense, they're supposed to be Kenyans because their fathers are Kenyans. But because the system has failed, you make um, a whole child become a refugee and get locked out of that. There's already a whole case uh, which is in court about that. And that is all because of um, when you have um, systems that are, are not um, realistic. So right now the government is saying that with the UPI, they want to eliminate vetting, which is a good initiative. Uh, the practicality of it is hard um, because they've only piloted it for the children born at the hospital at zero uh, days. So for the adults who are outside there, uh, they've not yet told us how it will eliminate, eliminate vetting. So these are things that we are still discussing, but yeah, they've said uh, they, they want to discuss that. So um, it is something that is being discussed and is still at the discussion level. One of the things uh, we, we think needs to be done is, is in terms of policy reform, because governments come and go, but laws tick. So uh, for us, we want to be able to have a law that anchors that how does UPI protect you from being vetted every year, every time you apply for a document. So that is one thing that we are trying to look at. How can we anchor it in law so that another government does not come and water down this? Um, so I hope I've answered you anonymous. Uh, for Tom Fisher, um, first and foremost, uh, <laughs> ID for Africa is always, uh, it's like uh, we say uh, peer pressure. Uh, everybody sees someone do, rolling out a system, uh, you want to roll out and uh, share it as a best practice. Uh, the government wanted to roll out this thing um, before the ID for Africa summit, and we told the government it's not possible to have this. Uh, you'll have a lot of court uh, cases. When you talk about ID for Africa summit, it's uh, around 23rd of May, so it's a month from now. So um, unfortunately, they were not able to do this. At the moment, the government does not have funding for this project, um, but there's a possibility that the World Bank will be giving technical advice uh, because of the um, the um, uh, ID4D project. I am not sure at the moment, but during the time that we are looking at um, 
um, Huduma number, the World Bank came out strong and said they've not funded them. Uh, yes. For this UPI is still in the formative stage because they still don't even have, uh, they don't have a policy framework for it. They still don't have an operational framework for it. There's a lot to be done. Uh, even the public participation right now, the government is counting on civil society to help them with fundraising. So I'd say it's still um, not clear the role that the World Bank could have been playing, but I know ID for Africa could, have, uh, could, could maybe do advisory on the sides, I don't know, uh, because the Secretariat is in Kenya planning for the ID for Africa. But yeah, uh, I'd say for that, uh, it's not clear. I cannot speak for them and I cannot confirm because uh, the way I've seen the government is still struggling to fundraise for this project. That's the reason as to why they're trying to look at what are the existing structures that they have? What are the existing databases that they have? How can they capitalize on existing database uh, to just roll out the UPI instead of having a whole registration drive? So that's uh, my remark on that. Is there any other burning one before I run away? I, I think, Mustafa, you've been very generous with your time, so thank you. And I, I'm conscious we have to move the agenda on to the next speaker. Um, so thank, so you. thank you for joining us, Mustafa. That was really insightful. Um, uh, and I'm going to now invite my colleague at the OII, Dr. Anna Valdivia, to talk about um, biometrics uh, implemented at European borders and some of the limits and risks of this technology and how it could jeopardise fundamental human rights. So over to you, Anna. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so I share some slides. Can you see the slides correctly? We can. Okay, thank you. Um, so as Mark has said, I'm gonna talk today about biometrics at the European borders. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an experience and expertise in Kenya, but um, when we were organizing this event, we found out like some connections with uh, the private companies that are developing both um, biometrics in Kenya and biometrics at the European border. So I have um, structured the talk today as follows. So first uh, I'm gonna start with the motivation of, of the topic, and then I'm gonna explain how biometrics work from a technical perspective and which are the private actors uh, that are taking part in this uh, biometric ecosystem at the European border. And finally, I'll wrap up with uh, some conclusions. So the motivation is that um, we have, when we are analyzing biometrics at the European borders, uh, at, an, at, at any border, we have to take to bear in mind that there is a lack of um, safe and legal routes and procedures for claiming asylum. And then in the context of uh, the European Union, we have to uh, consider Dublin Regulation, which is a legal framework that um, says which country is responsible of the asylum application. So imagine that um, you know, someone from uh, Senegal arrives to Canary Island um, by boat and then claims asylum there. The first thing that uh, the police, um, the border authorities are gonna do is to take their fingerprints and then send this fingerprint to a European database, which name is um, Eurodac. And then if this person wants to um, move to France because it has a cousin in uh, a relative in, in France, the French authorities are, if they intercept that person at the border, they're gonna ask for the fingerprint and then um, they're gonna check uh, in this database if this fingerprint has, taken before, has been taken before. In a positive, in, in the positive in the positive case that the algorithm says that there is a match, and this is what we call um, as positive in machine learning or in biometrics, they are gonna give uh, so the database is gonna give the information that this person um, claim asylum in Spain, and then the border authorities, the French border authorities, can send um, this person back to Spain because um, given Dublin regulation, um, Spain is a responsible of this asylum seeker. So this is what we have to bear in mind any time that we are analyzing biometrics, biometrics and technology at the uh, European borders. Um, so in this landscape, in the re recent years, um, Europe, European Union has been investing a lot of money uh, in biometrics for uh, migration control. Uh, and then in this uh, table, we have like, several projects uh, that um, different um, agencies 
and institutions um, have been adopted uh, regarding uh, biometrics, and we have uh, we see we seen that um, you know there has been a lot of money implemented and invested in order to create like these large databases to identify uh, people that cross uh, borders. So how biometrics works uh, technically? Uh, so um, as this um, picture shows, first. Um, we have to extract a biometric trait, which can be a fingerprint, a face, voice, and then uh, once we take this, uh, let's say this fingerprint, um, the algorithm is able to extract some patterns within this image. And then through these patterns, it can um, analyze whether these patterns are similar to other fingerprints, and then through um, this uh, patterns the algorithm can give to the humans um, a score that says how similar two uh, biometric traits or two fingerprints are. And based on this similarity score, it can say whether the um, comparison is genuine, which means uh, in biometric concept, is a biometric concept that says that two bi um, biometric traits are um, very similar, so there is a there is is very likely that they belong to the same uh, person, or rather, um, if the similarity score is very low, is under a threshold. Um, biometric says that this is an imposter, which means that um, these two biometric traits, these two fingerprints, uh, don't belong to the same uh, to the same person. So this is um, technically how biometrics work. So basically, we have a database with a lot of fingerprints and then an algorithm running there. And then any time that, for instance, um, border authorities are taking fingerprints to border crossers, uh, they send these uh, fingerprints to these um, databases. And then the algorithm finds uh, similarity scores. And then it tells to the police whether there is like a very similar, a genuine um, a, a genuine um, instance in the database or, or not. So in the European uh, scenario, um, we have different biometric uh, database that have been uh, implemented for different purpose. When we talk about um, asylum uh, application, asylum seekers, uh, we have to um, look at uh, Eurodac. Eurodac, Eurodac is a biometric database that was uh, is basically enforcing Dublin regulation. Uh, as I say before, any time that um, border authorities uh, and member states are suspicious that someone that is crossing the border could have applied for um, asylum in another uh, member state, they get into they get into uh, Eurodac. But that's not the only uh, database for migration control. Um, uh, we also have uh, the visa information system that, for instance, um, it takes uh, fingerprints for uh, people that apply for short stay visas. We also have a Schengen information uh, system that basically um, stores information about uh, crimes and it not only stores fingerprints and biometrics, it can also store uh, pictures of like, for instance, stolen cars or uh, images of uh, people's tattoos uh, that uh, police think that um, they are useful to um, identify, identify them. And in the incoming years, uh, the uh, member states have been trying to implement uh, two new uh, databases, which are uh, the entry access system and ETS, but uh, uh, funnily enough, or interestingly, uh, they have been delayed because of a lot of like uh, technical difficulties. So we have to bear in mind also when we are analyzing biometrics that it's not that easy to implement these systems because um, you know like we have to coordinate uh, all member states. Uh, with one same software that um, they're gonna have like access to these databases. And for instance, there are like some places um, in these member states where they don't have access to um, electricity. So it's kind of like complicated to send uh, and to connect um, their devices into uh, these databases. So um, there's a lot of difficulties to implement uh, biometrics. And the reason why uh, for the European Union is taking so long 
to implement this new um, database in the interactive system on, on ETS. So how are these um, biometrics, uh, biometric databases in, impacting on, on people's lives? Several um, academics and also organizations have been investigating uh, that from different perspectives. And for instance, we have in this um, paper that was pub published in 2020, um, two scholars were analyzing how um, the, um, this um, this was in, uh, impacting on, on um, people asking for a, a visa in, in Germany. And they uh, exposed this case on this paper about a woman that was uh, pregnant and, and I think she was from Ghana and she was applying for an extension of, of her visa. But when the officers in Germany uh, took her fingerprint, they saw that there was like some kind of um, match with uh, someone else. So the database at this was saying that the fingerprint was matching another person while the, um, uh, that person was saying that, it, it, that that identity on this database didn't belong to her. But because she didn't have a passport, she couldn't, she couldn't um, you know, like prove with a paper that the identity of that person in the database was uh, not her. So the officers, uh, and, and it's very interesting how the scholars show in this in this paper that the officers kind of rely more on the outcome of the algorithm at this uh, this uh, database rather than the narrative of this uh, uh, applic this person who wanted to apply for a visa in in Germany. And also, um, so before joining the Oxford Internet Institute, I was a postdoc at uh, King's College London within a project uh, which name is Security Flows. And within this project, we were also um, analyzing some um, tribunal cases in the UK where like asylum seekers got like a rejection on their asylum application. And this case is quite interesting because it shows how uh, a per, uh, an asylum seeker was looking for asylum in, in the UK, got uh, his rejection because, uh, so one of the arguments um, among others that the judge was doing in, in this case was that um, her, his fingerprint uh, was stored at Eurodac uh, in 2016, while the narrative of the asylum seeker was that he was he, the first time he came to uh, the European Union was in 2000 in 2017. So because of this incoherence uh, uh, on you know on the asylum seeker narrative and the biometrics, the judge uh, took this argument, took this like evidence, algorithmic evidence among other other um, um, evidences as a, a way to um, reject um, his asylum case. So uh, from a more cynical perspective, when we look at how uh, biometrics could impact on fundamental rights and on people's lives, uh, we have to consider um, errors, uh, technical errors, like how these biometrics um, can be wrong. And when we look at biometrics, uh, we have to consider uh, false matches and false non-matches. Uh, so a false match is when the you have like two fingerprints, for instance, or two faces that they don't belong to the same person, but the biometrics say that they do belong to the same person. And on the other hand, we have a, fa a false non-match, which means when you have like two fingerprints, or like two uh, faces that they do belong to the same person, but the algorithm says it doesn't belong to the same person. So these are like the two types of errors that biometrics can um, have. And then um, in the European Union, there is a lack of, uh, a critical lack of accountability because we don't know what are like the um, error rates of these uh, biometrics that are implemented in these databases, let's say Eurodac, these. So there is a completely lack of accountability because um, you know, uh, organizations, scholars that have been investigating this for a long time, um, we don't know what are like the metrics that are um, the performance of these algorithms that are uh, deciding whether uh, a person is sending back to another member state because it, uh, there is a match on uh, um, a database like uh, Eurodac. So this is 
So which are the private actors that are developing uh, these biometrics? When we are analyzing biometrics, we have to bear in mind that any biometric system or most of the biometric systems implemented uh, by governments uh, rely on private actors because uh, governments, they don't have the infrastructure and then they don't have like um, the technicals, the, the technicians to develop these um, systems. So they have to rely on private actors. And for this, they um, they announce contracts uh, that then private actors um, apply in order to develop these uh, biometric systems for any uh, reason, like for border control or for um, digital ID. So uh, when I was a postdoc at this uh, security close project, uh, we developed a methodology, a transdisciplinary me methodology to try to understand uh, who are getting, which private actors are getting these contracts for developing and maintaining these biometric systems, these biometric databases, and also uh, how much money they are getting, and more importantly, how they are connected. Um, because we were wondering whether they are like competing between, um, between private actors or rather they are um, cooperating in order to uh, get these contracts and uh, implement, get this money and then implement these biometric databases. So uh, within this methodology, we uh, focus on contracts announced by uh, two EU agencies that are one, um, two of the most uh, relevant agencies uh, when uh, you want to analyze the uh, um, economy, the political economy of, of borders, which are ULISA and, and Frontex. And we have been, uh, so this methodology allow us to conclude that in the last uh, years, there has been an increase of the investment um, in these two agencies. So they have put, like, they have announced contracts uh, with, um, um, very, very expensive. And this has been like a trend that has increased in the last in the last years. And then we through this methodology, we were all also able to analyze which are like the most uh, expensive contracts. And interestingly, we observed that on the case of Ulisa, this EU agency, uh, uh, the most expensive contract was for the implementation and maintenance of the entry exit system. That is this database that is gonna be um, implemented uh, maybe this year, maybe next year, because as I say at the beginning, it has been uh, postponed because of difficulties in the implementation. So after we analyze um, the trends of uh, how much money is invested in the private sector and also uh, what are like the most relevant contracts, we also analyze uh, whether um, private actors collaborate or they compete. And for this, we were analyzing um, whether like um, companies apply together to, this, to these contracts. And then we found out that in the case of Yolisa, um, all the companies, all the private companies that are developing uh, biometrics databases, let's say Eurodac, this is our the entry active system, um, remain to the same private actors. Uh, and here in this uh, graph, for instance, we observe that Soprasteria, Thales, Atos, Accenture, Idemia are uh, the most common uh, private actors that are getting all these contracts announced by ULISA to develop these biometric um, databases. Uh, so looking more uh, in detail about this on, on these contracts, we observe like, for instance, uh, the most expensive, uh, so the entry exit system has cost more than 400 million euros. Uh, and then um, there has been like three contracts announced by ULISA to maintain, design, or implement this uh, database. And it has been uh, awarded to Soprasteria, Idemia, Atos, IBM, and Leonardo. And we observe also like how IDEMI and Superstereo are two actors that also got the contracts to develop or maintain this, CIS, and um, Eurodac. So uh, once we were able to understand and to observe who were 
uh, who are the private companies that are getting these biometric systems, we were um, able to, under, uh, to um, analyze the uh, performance of their own algorithms. NIST is uh, an institution at the, uh, in the US that analyzes the performance of fingerprints and facial recognitions facial recognition algorithms um, developed by private companies. And for instance, they released this analysis that shows um, the facial recognition accuracy of different private actors. And we observe that the industry is gaining uh, accuracy. So biometrics uh, are getting more and more um, accurate. However, um, there is also like some errors and these errors are different depending on demographic groups. Uh, in this report, uh, NIST uh, also show what was the um, fairness errors of uh, biometrics by IBMIA and we observed that errors were larger on women. So we see here how the box plots are larger on uh, on the, on, on, on the women, but also when we look at this uh, analysis from a, an intersectional perspective, we observe that Indian women had like larger errors than uh, white women or black uh, women. But when we're uh, critically analyzing um, how biometrics impacts on, on, on people, we have to move uh, the debate beyond biases. Because um, it's true that biases and errors on biometrics and impact on, 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 on humans, but we have to move the debate uh, beyond that. And in order to move this debate beyond, we have to also look at the political economy and also how more broadly um, this collaboration between governments uh, and policy uh, and, and private actors are uh, impacting on fundamental uh, rights. And for instance, we have like these two cases that connects with the talk today about how, for instance, um, this company, Idemia, that has been awarded um, different uh, contracts to develop biometrics at the European border, um, has also been taking part into um, this project on, in Kenya to develop um, ID, um, digital IDs. And we have seen how um, they have vulnerated some uh, human rights beyond biases on algorithms. Because for instance, there is a law in French, in France that says uh, that any uh, private company have to disclose, uh, have to like write a report about how they, could, they think that their products could impact on human rights and data rights uh, that is an, organiz uh, uh, an organi non governmental uh, organization challenged uh, this uh, company, this French company, and took Idemian to the court because uh, they saw how there was a clearly lacking at how this um, company, um, you know, analyzed the risk, the, uh, the risk of their products in, in Kenya. So uh, the conclusion for my talk today is that um, when we look at how algorithms, and in this case, biometrics uh, jeopardize fundamental rights, we have to look at historical forms of oppression. And when uh, specifically we are looking at how biometrics are jeopardizing fundamental rights at the border, we have to uh, look at how borders as an infrastructure, as a political infrastructure has been uh, oppressing uh, people on the move uh, for um, centuries and centuries. So, so um, it's, not bio, it's not biometrics, it's not the algorithm that is oppressing, it's the infrastructure. And then the, these tools, these algorithmic tools are being instrumentalized in order to reinforce uh, these historical oppressions. And in the specific case of biometrics, we see how, for instance, uh, Galton, that was a Victorian uh, scientist, uh, implemented and start analyzing, uh, began analyzing biometrics in the 18th century in order to identify uh, people in the British colonies like India, because uh, Galton was saying that they were disabled, so they could, um, you know, lie with their identity. So they had to use fingerprints in order to have like a scientific method uh, to um, um, identify them in a more truthful way. And it's very interesting to see how this argument of uh, trustworthy 
scientific methods is also used nowadays by the European Union in order to justify the uh, use of biometrics at the border. Uh, and then, for instance, uh, looking uh, more in deep in the archive of, of Galton that is uh, located here uh, in, in, in the UK and in London, we saw how um, not only, so Galton was not only taking fingerprints uh, into uh, about like uh, individuals in colonies, it was also taking um, fingerprints of a different, what he considered human races, because uh, he wanted to analyze whether um, these human races we had they had like different patterns in their fingerprints. Um, so you, we also like see how this um, biometrics um, science is linked to this colonial uh, past, but also like to this eugenic uh, and racist um, science. So finally, um, I would like to, to wrap up saying that biometrics is widely applied at the European borders and is instrumentalized sometimes for criminalizing uh, migrants, but we have to move the debate beyond um, this critique towards uh, algorithms and consider that borders as infrastructure um, also uh, discriminate that there is a lack of transparency and accountability at European borders. It's very difficult uh, to uh, try to analyze who are like, the private companies that um, develop this, this technology, because for instance, this methodology that uh, we created allow us to uh, analyze how much money, for instance, Idemia is getting, but there is also like a part of opacity because part of these um, contracts are subcontracted but this subcontraction, like which other companies are being subcontracted, is not shown on these contracts. So it's very difficult to track uh, all this uh, political economy. Uh, so there is like this exercise of transparency by the European Union, but there is also like a, a side of um, opacity. And finally, there is a need to analyze the impact and fundamental right violations of these systems um, at the border in general, and that for this, we need uh, transdisciplinary teams and also uh, collaborate with organizations in order to uh, better understand um, these uh, different mechanisms of oppression at the border. So thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk today. Thank you, Anna, that's, that's great. Um, I, I know there was a few questions in the Q&A, but I think um, Yasser may be answering some of those specific to the, the Kenyan case. And we're now gonna to go to, um, to, to Laurie Rousey, who is gonna talk about privacy and data protection in digital ID systems. And I, I think Laurie's gonna also um, refer back to some of the, the, the Kenya, um, some of the, the, the Kenya case um, facts that we've talked about so far. So I'll pass over to, um, to Laurie for this part of the, the session. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, this was this was really interesting and uh, ties nicely with um, some of the points that I'm going to highlight. Um, so my intervention here is really at the intersection of questions of privacy laws and uh, the litigation that we did in France started rather with the Nubian Rights Forum uh, going after this French organization that Anna was talking a lot about, which is called IDEMIA. And that is indeed uh, in many contracts in the European Union in relation with biometrics. Um, so just, um, just to start with, uh, I feel it's useful to take a step back also because I did note that some questions mentioned the World Bank um, and so for those that are not privy to these questions already, uh, it's useful to look at 2015. So in 2015, the European, the, sorry, the UN um, formulated 17 sustainable development goals, i.e. goals that were supposed to be followed to ensure sustainable development. Now, um, the goal number 16 that I'm going to read is really relevant for the questions that we're talking about today. So this goal says, um, promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all level. Now, it's very interesting because this goal 
um, formulated by the UN has sub goals. And so the sub goal number nine says, and this is what is very relevant for us, by 2030, um, provide legal identity for all, including birth registration. Now, this is extremely interesting because this has actually helped to channel um, funding on projects in associated with digital IDs uh, for better or for worse. Um, and on this, I should really stress this keynote that I have um, that I have watched a few weeks ago from the former UN reporter on racism and racial discrimination, uh, Madam Tendai Achume, uh, where she not only stressed that the Kenyan and the Indian case, uh, cases of uh, digital ID were absolutely uh, dystopian, but she also said, and on here I'm going to quote her, uh, that she was um, that this was showing the emergence of um, racial digital borders, uh, end quote. And so this is really interesting because this is really tying with what Anna was talking about in relation with uh, the evolution of what borders may become in terms of implementing biometrics. Um, <clears throat> so because most of the rest of my intervention is going to be about Kenya, I just want to say a word about India. Uh, so in India, and mind you, the service provider is the same company, so the French multinational Edemia. Uh, in Demia, uh, sorry, in India, for example, individuals have died. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons for death were that um, for people to question the fact that the system had not recognized them, and that can happen for many reasons, such as you are working on the land and your digits are not perfectly readable that day. Um, people could not actually question the fact that all of a sudden the service could not recognize them. Uh, and in these cases, it were it was people that were very poor. And so that meant they could not have their daily ration. Now, if this is happening a few days in a row, you can see how uh, this led to the death of people from the starvation, because uh, we could say, fair, uh, yeah, we could say a glitch of the system, uh, which is quite daunting. Now, uh, moving to the Kenyan case, because this is really what uh, we're talking about today. Um, so in 2018, the Kenyan government was looking into creating this digital ID system. And for this, contracted with this French multinational Edemia um, for them to support. Um, there is uh, at the moment um, lack of details on how much exactly were they supporting. Um, so this is definitely a core aspect of the case because we have a lot of very contradicting information that is available, which raises considerable questions around um, accountability of the Kenyan government, but also of a multinational. Um, <clears throat> what's very interesting to know um, is that, as many of you probably know, in 2018, the um, European Union's data protection law reform entered into force. And this is very interesting in our case because um, so in European law, but also in Kenyan law, I'm going to talk about this later, uh, we have this critical di distinction between two roles, the data controller and the data processor. So the data controller is, um, as, we, uh, as it is stated in the law, the, the entity that controls the purpose and the means of a project involving personal data. And the data processor is uh, the, the entity helping the data controller to get this project to happen. Um, <clears throat> so we could, probably, we could probably easily just say the data processor is a service provider. Now, this is very interesting because uh, in our case in Kenya, this is, this is where a lot uh, depends on, because if you are recognized as a data processor, then you inherit a very high legal requirements to protect people, to make sure that the system is safe. And so, um, and including outside of Europe. And so <clears throat> let me first pause on this point. Uh, what do we mean by even outside of Europe? Because obviously this is where Kenya comes in the picture, right? Um, so as, as, a, as a data protection, protection practitioner, I'm often being told, well, hang on a second, uh, most laws stop at the European Union borders. 
why are you saying that this is not the case here? Uh, this is really interesting because uh, this is actually a lack of understanding of how European law works because uh, we are, you know, at the core of our legal system, we have uh, human rights, fundamental human rights. And so the right to data protection and the right to privacy are associated with fundamental human rights historically um, to protect people from state surveillance. Now, this is very interesting because uh, the reform of the European Union on data protection called GDPR um, is from this. And so this is not just any law that would, for example, you know, regulate, oh, you have to uh, do your tax returns this way. No, no, this is about human rights. And this is what is really important to understand. Um, I am carrying um, some of uh, the European obligations with me if I travel abroad, if this is about human rights. Let's imagine for the sake of the argument that I'm going to a country where torture um, is not illegal. Well, as a European, uh, if I'm going there and torture people, I am carrying with my nationality the fact that no, I'm not allowed to torture people. It's exactly the same thinking. Um, so Idemia, as a French company, is carrying with it with itself the obligation to make sure that it's not facilitating um, a uh, data processing system from an entity that is paying uh, Edemia that abuses human rights. Uh, I hope I hope this is something that uh, yeah that that makes sense because this is really central to the case. And so, <clears throat> regardless of whether they are deciding to uh, do the project or just facilitate the project. This is the notion of data controller, data processor. Um, and so continuing on this thinking, if they were to be recognized as having acted as data processor in Kenya, then all of a sudden they would have had the obligation to push back if they're facilitating uh, egregious abuses of, of, of people's rights through how their data uh, ends up being used or not. And so typically here, we're talking about entire communities being discriminated for a project that actually at the end of the day aims to condition access to basic services like you know, hospitals. Uh, this is critical. You cannot facilitate this without making sure that, um, that you're not pushing back if people are actually uh, discriminated en masse. Um, I have been also asked to, um, to draw some uh, lessons learned and some parallels with uh, European law on data protection. So I'm going to do this now. Uh, Mustafa already very helpfully mentioned the ruling. So I'm going to come back on that one. There's a ruling uh, rendered by the um, uh, Kenyan High Court in January 2020, where the Nubian Rights Forum is a plaintiff. And indeed, as Mustafa highlighted, uh, it was uh, decided by the judges that um, <clears throat> the plan was to collect the um, DNA data and GPS location data from individuals. And uh, the judges agreed with the plaintiffs that apparently there was absolutely no reason to collect that data. Therefore, it was absolutely not possible to collect that data, which is very interesting because um, from the European lens, we would absolutely align with this. This is absolutely European law as well. Um, and so this boils down to the notion of data minimization. You only collect what you need. And um, the, the, the backbone of this, um, of this principle is what we call in Europe purpose creep. So you, know, you also have to have a clear plan for people to be able to be informed, and you have to be informed them, to be informed on how exactly is their data going to be used so that they can you know, push back, demonstrate if they disagree, or you know, um, change the way they will uh, deal with certain things, knowing, oh, actually, this data is going to be used this way. Therefore, you know, this is particularly useful often with health uh, data where people don't want, for example, people around them to know that they have HIV or, you know. Um, <clears throat> and then a second decision is uh, particularly interesting. Uh, even more interesting to some degree. Uh, so the, the same court, the Kenyan um, High Court, ruled in October 2021 uh, that uh, this Huduma, so this project of digital ID in Kenya was um, had to be paused, uh, just simply just paused, because actually the government had not been able to prove 
that they had made sure that the system is safe, which is which is stunning. Um, <clears throat> and so this is definitely a parallel that we also have where, between Kenya and, uh, and, and Europe, because if you have um, a huge, um, a project that involves huge volumes, high stakes, you absolutely have the obligation to do um, risk assessment, to uh, rate the risks, all high risks, at least, I would say even medium risks, uh, must be uh, tackled, mitigated before you can consider moving forward with the project. And ideally, you have to actually publish all this work. So the assessment, the follow up on uh, mitigations so that, you know, we 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 embed uh, accountability in the system. Um, and so this is this is fundamental. Um, and so in that case, the ruling is particularly interesting because the, um, the judges said, OK, so you did none, no assessments whatsoever to make sure that human rights uh, would not be impacted. Um, and, and the government's response was, well, <clears throat> the, in, in 2019, Kenya uh, passed its data protection law, closely modeled on uh, the European law. And, uh, and that became effective only in 2021. So the government in Kenya said, well, look, there, there was no data, sorry, no uh, data protection law at the time. So, well, of course we did nothing. And this is really interesting because the judges said, hold on a second, uh, surely, surely you can't be serious. Um, at that time already in the Kenyan constitution, there was um, the upholding of the right to privacy, surely you could not expect that this um, this right enshrined in the constitution of our country meant nothing if you were rolling out a huge project on biometrics. Um, this is very interesting. This is very interesting in itself. Uh, what I mentioned about um, um, risk assessments and mitigations and accountability, so that was already expected. Um, by by the court in Kenya, this would definitely be expected as well in Europe. Um, and I should I should add that uh, the, Euro the European model and I expect the Kenyan model as well also says, and your risk assessment needs to be contextualized, which is extremely interesting, because even if you're a Western company and you're planning on rolling out this very technology that you've been using in, um, I don't know, any Western country, uh, if you're actually rolling it out in a country like Kenya, you should also take into account, okay, here they have tribes, here historically some tribes have been discriminated, you know, which is, which is, yeah, which is very interesting to, uh, to look at, um, thinking about how we're going to develop uh, digital ID systems in the 21st century. Um, I have been asked to mention uh, the, um, the rules in Kenya at the moment. So again, as I said, uh, Kenya now has a data protection law that is closely modeled on the European um, model, which is at the moment still considered the gold standard in the world. Um, I should really stress uh, what I mentioned quickly. So the notions uh, of data processor and data controller are the exact same in Kenya. And this is very interesting because, again, this is really at the core of how much we can seek the accountability of a business that is actually facilitating egregious human rights uh, abuses. So this is this is very interesting. Um, now, I'm not a Kenyan law expert, but, but as, as a data protection uh, law specialist, I can say um, for the rest, how much is that law going to be effective? Frankly, it's too early to say because it has come into force in 2021. And so the European experience is clear. Um, the effectiveness of law of your law heavily depends on the resources of your data protection regulator. So yeah, uh, but we'll see. And then um, so some last uh, words about the very case where we are working as data rights with the Nubian Rights Forum. Um, <clears throat> so as mentioned by Anna, we have started this case last summer uh, with the Nubian Rights Forum and the Kenyan uh, Human Rights Com Commission. It is built on this new law that, um, that dates back from 2017 in France. So this law, um, <clears throat> which we will call due diligence, but in French, just to say the, the name is Loi de Vigilance. Um, <clears throat> this law is considered to be a pioneer. Um, it's considered to be a pioneer because the, the end goal 
is really to just figure out, okay, when we have multinationals from a set, certain financial threshold, um, I should say turnover, um, they are going to be expected to be accountable on how uh, they can harm with their activities outside of the country. And specifically, and I really want to highlight this because that makes that law very powerful, uh, the law is built on a core, which is uh, taking into account human rights abuse and environmental abuse. In our case, we're going after human rights abuses primarily. But I just, I just really need to stress this because <clears throat> this, is, this is partly why this law is considered to be a pioneer. Very simple, yet potentially very effective. Um, I also want to stress uh, before I, um, I move to my next point, I really want to stress that at the moment uh, in Brussels, European institutions are working on um, a similar law that would be applying to the, all the countries in the European Union. And uh, so the, um, that project at the moment is, is pretty much copying the French model, which is also why our case is really interesting for the reason that I'm also going to now talk about. Um, the stake of this case uh, from our perspective is not just about data protection uh, and, and the right for people to not find themselves discriminated based on how a uh, digital system works. Um, it's also beyond this. Uh, it, it, it's about this question of <clears throat> what I mentioned earlier about being a data processor and therefore potentially not being accountable. We disagree with this. And so this whole question uh, beyond data protection is how are we happy uh, to have models that are pretty much the Pegasus scandal model? You know, I am a service provider. I am going to give you, I'm going to provide you with tools that actually facilitate uh, egregious human rights abuses. Uh, but then if, uh, if someone knocks at my door and says, well, uh, how could this even be possible? How could you get involved like this? Then for how, how is it okay for business to say, wait, hang on a second. I'm not responsible for anything. Uh, this is just my clients and the way they use my tool that is problematic. I have nothing to do with this. These are definitely questions that are central to, um, to our case. And so this is called dual use. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm selling a product. Yes, it could do a lot of great stuff, but it's also um, potentially um, harming hugely uh, individuals and democracies in general. Uh, so the business behind Pegasus is having that position. In our case, Edemia had exactly the same arguments, um, <clears throat> which I should mention, uh, the European Union is at the moment, institutions are at the moment uh, looking into excluding questions of dual use from the regulation uh, to make sure that uh, there's corporate responsibility for multinationals. So um, a lot of work in front of us. Um, <clears throat> and so to conclude, um, well, first of all, I've really hesitated to mention this, but I find this really relevant. So I'm going to mention it. Um, in 2019, this French multinational that is involved in Kenya um, and the digital ID case. Kenya, was, uh, sorry, Edemia was actually banned to do more uh, business in, uh, in Kenya by the Kenyan parliament. Okay, there's been a decision from the parliament to ban uh, Edemia. And Edemia, what they did is that they actually sued that decision and uh, won based on niche uh, business uh, laws. And so this is this is also showing, you know, the, the 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 attitude at the moment of multinationals, which I find really useful to stress. Um, and uh, last but certainly not least, um, we have learned a few months ago that uh, Edemia has been selected by the European Commission to lead on the pilot for the European Union, uh, the European Union's digital ID uh, project. So quite exciting especially when you consider, as Anna rightly highlighted, although we don't have much data at the moment to uh, prove that it would be the case in India or Kenya, but imagine uh, that the algorithms uh, would have been trained on individuals that could not use their rights to push back. And, uh, and now we have algorithms that have been trained this way and that could benefit, benefit um, every European uh, citizen. That's it for me. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, don't hesitate. Thank you, Laurie. Um, 
fascinating stuff. Um, and yes, please do put questions into the Q and A. Um, and I'm going to, um, uh, and we'll have um, some Q and A and discussion at the end as well. Um, but, but before we conclude, um, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Keegan McBride. He's going to talk about technology ownership and the involvement of foreign private companies and how that affects uh, data privacy and protection. So over to you, Keegan. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. I will move fairly quickly through this just in the essence of time. Um, mine is, I think, only indirectly related to the topic of digital identity and what we've been talking about today. But I do think that it's important that you know, we talk about it. And, and there are certainly overlaps, which uh, I will try to get to at the end in the discussion and conclusion part. So very quickly, the plan is to talk about uh, bias in academic research towards non -West, or towards Western uh, sort of context. I want to move into talking about non-Western public administration, talking about digital technologies and the relationship with you know good governance, emerging initiatives, uh, these ideas around power, control, ownership of tech information, and then future research directions and areas for development. So as a starting point. I think it's really important we acknowledge that when it comes to sort of academic research into, let's say, governance or digital identity systems or digitalization of the public sector or public administration more broadly, um, and really across pretty much all disciplines, academic research is heavily biased towards Western and especially native English speaking countries like the US, the UK, um, and also well funded academics and researchers who tend to come from, from these countries. Uh, and what this means is that non-Western contexts are not necessarily covered by existing research because existing knowledge cannot necessarily be directly applied to these contexts. Uh, you know, uh, different contexts really, really influences the applicability of research, especially in, in the social sciences. And therefore, this is especially true when we're talking around uh, areas like governance, government management. So one area where you see this quite a lot is in public administration. Uh, which is essentially based primarily on, on you know, research that's one or 200 years old from, uh, from Germany, if we're talking about Max Weber, in terms of like publishing, I think 60 or 70% of articles are, are coming from the Netherlands. Uh, but there has been a lot of in, uh, interest recently on, you know, sort of de-Westernizing public administration, let's say. Uh, so Bukert in 2017, you know, says that a combination of two Western public administration, which is based on two Western philosophies, uh, it's not always uh, traveling well. We really need to have uh, public administration communities according to different cultural communities. And girls similarly said that you know, non-Western philosophies may contribute immensely to the field of public administration globally, uh, not just locally where they originated, and that the dialogue between Western and non-Western philosophies is of the greatest significance for the advancement of our field globally. And this makes sense because Philosophers, scholars have been working on administration and organization for thousands of years. The first public administration sort of emerged in, in China. There's a long history of uh, Buddhist public administration, of Islamic public administration. And this is what people have used as the backbone for proposing this idea about opening up the scholarship around governance and public administration uh, to this more non-Western perspective. Uh, with Drexler here noting that countries and places that do not adhere to or fail at least to move towards the global Western standard, even if this is understood to include significant regional variations, which is not always the case, are somehow remiss, they do not provide optimal PA and thus governance. The only excuse they may have is that they are laggards, they are in transition, but they are expected to eventually arrive at global Western PA. So in essence, if you're not doing global Western public administration with its values associated with transparency and this quote unquote good governance uh, of which digital technologies are now becoming a part, then you are not a good country. And this is a little bit oversimplifying, but this really is sort of the narrative that you see. And I hope you can see the, the you know, clear overlap with this theme of digital identity, right? If we're talking about digitalization of the public sector, if we're talking about a digital government, digital identity is certainly one core part of that. But what it means is, with this pressure coming from international organizations, be it the World Bank, the International Monetary Foundation, uh, you know, whatever it is, they basically view this digitalization of the public sector as good government. So if you're not digital, you're not a good government. Um, once again, this is probably oversimplifying it, but you really are seeing this emerge, that digital is no longer optional. It's something that must be done. And this implies 
that a digital identity is something that you must have. But, you know, we have to ask some important questions here because there is many risks, there are many risks that come uh, along with digitalizing the public sector. And yes, there might be some benefits related to, you know, anti-corruption or efficiency or better service delivery. It's not really only a technology we're talking about here. And it requires a holistic and comprehensive reform uh, from administration to infrastructure to legislation to regulation and so on. So if we zoom into, you know, the African continent, uh, this is the results from the 2022 e-government development index survey. You can see across the board uh, that in Africa and in essentially every region within Africa, they perform below the world average when it comes to digitalization of the public sector. Uh, what this means is that most countries are already going to be starting off on, on you know, weaker ground uh, compared to, let's say, Western countries. Uh, to bring it back into Kenya, Kenya's actually doing quite well. I think they've developed uh, over time. They're still in one of the lower performing uh, groupings, but they, they, they have certainly improved since 2003 when the survey started. Uh, but you can see, for example, the regional, uh, the region leader, South Africa, is far ahead, as well as the sub-region leader of Mauritius. Um, and the world leader, Denmark, is, is certainly ahead of everyone else. But once again, uh, a core component of this index would be, you know, the presence of a digital identity system. And what this has led to, right, is you have a situation where many people are thinking, okay, if technology is good and technology can be used for, for development, how can we make this process more efficient and more effective? And so you have seen a bunch of international initiatives emerge around this. So principles for digital development is, is you know, these principles that many organizations are subscribing to now, um, you know, designing with the user, understanding the existing ecosystem, designing for scale, building for sustainability, you know, being data-driven, using open standards, reusing and improving, uh, addressing privacy and security, being collaborative. And for example, this is something the Digital Public Goods Alliance uh, aligns with. The DPGA uh, comes, uh, well, I guess in the last two or three years, and they're trying to develop these uh, digital public goods that are relevant to sustainable uh, SDGs that we've heard a little bit about today. You know, they use open licenses, there's clear ownership, there's platform independence, they're documented, they're adhering to privacy uh, and applicable laws, you have mechanisms for extracting data, and you also do no harm by design. So data privacy and security are there. You shouldn't be able to uh, use these uh, digital public goods to spread illegal content. You shouldn't be using them for harassing. And the idea here is that, you know, to assist, let's say, uh, developing countries, we, the specialists coming from uh, Germany, from, from America, from the private sector, from, from public sector, from NGOs, can use our expertise to develop these sort of digital public goods in an open source, open format that then could then be reused uh, anywhere in the world to sort of, let's say, boost up capacity. This is the, the idea behind it. Uh, similarly related to the DPGA is, is GovStack, which aims to break down the barriers to building sustainable digital infrastructure and help governments create human-centered digital services that empower individuals and improve well-being. There's a lot of buzzwords in there, but essentially GovStack is trying to take open source uh, digital components put it together into a platform technology stack and say, if you use these technologies, you can build a digital government. And the idea is that in countries that don't necessarily have the capacity or the competency to build their own digital services, you know, you could subsidize it via the adoption of GovStack. The problem is, and, and you will hear this from many of the members who, uh, consortium members, that private interests have really started to dominate uh, within GovStack and perhaps the sort of initial mission uh, is not what it used to be, whether formally um, it is or not. And this is just a little diagram of the, the GovStack and how they sort of have this whole of government uh, approach to it. And they also, you know, if you go through their wiki, they talk about the sort of prerequisites that you need to build a digital public sector, like having trust in the government, having effective rule of law, having appropriate legislation. Um, you know, it's really not just a technology component. Uh, or technological problem, uh, but this is still the focus of the project. But okay, so if we say that uh, digitalization is coming, that it's essential to be a part of, uh, you know, uh, for, for a good government, you would expect that we're making investments all over the world, but actually that's not really what you see. 
uh, from the perspective of the private sector companies. So on the top, you have a map of the cloud server locations, and you can see that while uh, North America and Europe are fairly well covered, you basically don't see any presence from, from big tech in Africa, uh, which tells you a lot about their development priorities, um, be it Amazon or Google or Oracle or, or IBM or any other cloud provider you want to, to insert here. And I think it's also important to highlight that, you know, when we're talking about technologies, these are embedded with the values of the creator and they're not necessarily in line with new contexts. Uh, what this means is that, you know, these technologies, especially when they're developed from Western com companies and, and even more so when they're coming from Silicon Valley and influenced with these ideas, if you try to take this and you put it into Kenya or into Chad or into Mali or into Libya, there's going to be this conflict between the values that are embedded within the technologies and the cultural values uh, within the, the country where they're being implemented. And this will lead to some sort of transformation even you know, in the society and the organization that's using it or in the technology itself. Uh, and it's important that you know, we understand this logic and value mediation, how it takes place, what its implications are. Similarly, you know, data, especially if we're talking about um, uh, in the public sector, it should be held by the government sort of locally. This is where you get into a lot of the ideas around data sovereignty in, in Europe at the moment. But due to the increasing reliance on, on cloud, this isn't necessarily the case. And due to economies of scale, uh, sort of poorer countries likely won't ever be able to match the, um, the ability of the private sector actors, which puts governments already on a back foot because they don't necessarily even own or control their own data. Of course, we can get into the legal uh, semantics about, about how to make this work and what is and is actually not, not happening. Uh, but there's certainly something to, to be said when data isn't held on your own territory uh, and is unlikely to be in the near future, which raises lots of interesting discussions and debates around uh, power control and legitimacy. And what does it mean when states are uh, not necessarily able to compete with or, or push back against the development coming from, from large private sector corporations. And yeah, when you're talking about digitalization in the non-Western context, uh, especially in, in Africa, there a lot of research shows that there are many issues here, you know, dependent on external expertise, high level of outsourcing, lack of capacity, institutional voids and regulatory gaps, uh, quit information in markets, lower levels of trust, you know, mismatch between off the shelf systems in different contexts. And, and so while there certainly is a need for experience uh, and, and development in this area, I think it's also important to highlight once again, that technology is not necessarily going to fix this. So if we're talking about a digital identity system as being a means to uh, fight corruption or uh, you know, improve service delivery, there are many other things that have to come along with this. Uh, such as improving capacity, making sure that these systems aren't being abused, making sure that you're able to build them and maintain them on your own, and, and so on. And then just thinking towards the future, just to think some issues that are particularly important to focus on, think about uh, for future yeah, research and development, you know, how are we integrating these non-Western and Western philosophies and best practices in governance administration? How can we sort of open up these, these debates and take into best practices that aren't coming from continental Europe or, or North America, uh, you know, exploring the implications of growing Western corporate control over digital technologies and the risk that this poses to non-Western states who tend to be uh, weaker in their ability to negotiate and, and push back against their interests, the, their interests being the public uh, private sector interests. Uh, you know, how do Western and non-Western values embedded within technologies mediate with each other? What are the implications of this mediation for societal transformation? and how to ensure increasingly digital development is done in a fair and equitable way. So it's empowering rather than disempowering. And admittedly, that was a lot of material in, in just a short amount of time. But as we're drawing near to the end of the event, I thought I would just sort of power through that um, and would be happy to take any questions as we move now into the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Keegan. And I'll invite all panelists to um, turn their video back on. Uh, and, and sort of rejoin the, the main room. Um, so uh, please do uh, put your questions in the Q&A for our panel. Um, we have, uh, one person has asked about the presentations being shared and yes, we will uh, ask panelists um, if we can share their presentations um, in, in a sort of post-event 
um, follow up email. Um, but now we have everybody back. And if Keegan can, uh, if we can unshare Keegan's screen, then um, we can. Uh, great, we can see everyone. Um, so I'll just before we start to um, get uh, further questions coming in. Um, I guess what I what I you know we, we've seen a great um, range of, of of perspectives there. We've we've seen the the Kenya specific example, and we've seen kind of more broadly how some of these systems work and, and maybe um, and maybe don't work in in some cases. I wonder um, you know if there are any countries out there you know um, starting to look at this and, and and thinking about implementing their own digital ID systems, you know, what are the top lessons they can learn from the experience in Kenya, but also um, experiences elsewhere? I wonder if, uh, and we've got Yasser here as well, um, who can who can perhaps help us on that, but I wonder if the panel could give their perspective. Laurie, you can go first. Um, what I like when I'm looking at projects like this is that if they could follow the law, that would be great. Uh, because the law is very clear. Uh, you do an assessment, you rate the risks. This is not this is not black magic. Uh, risk management has been around for a very long time. Uh, data protection uh, regulation is not, but uh, how to handle a project, um, w making sure that assessments are being done and then acted upon, this is not new at all. And um, so, yeah, building the project uh, with data protection and cybersecurity at the core uh, definitely is the number one, um, yeah, piece of advice. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, this was such a great uh, presentation. What I can say is um, we as uh, the Kenyan Kenyans, we've been working in a reversal manner whereby it took us um, moments for us to go to court so that the government could come up with policies that is uh, data privacy, uh, the Huduma Bill, and so on and so forth. So what I'd like to, from the other countries, is to make sure that um, they hold the government accountable, they be part of the system, and they also share these issues and the challenges that um, they have already been seeing with uh, the progressive countries like uh, country, uh, like Kenya. For instance, what I'd urge the participants and everybody is to make sure that this issue is not only a challenge to the discriminated community, because um, the Nubian community and other minority groups are affected directly on issues of digital platform. But when you look at the digital platform, it affects the entire nation. For instance, um, the Kenyan government saying that uh, they are going to digitize 5,000 jobs online. So this means if you do not or cannot access online services, you are completely locked out. And these policies also should be put into place. Basing in Africa, governments have been used to profile people. And if data protection acts are not put into place, then people can be profiled. You listened to Mustafa giving examples. So what I can say moving forward is there is need for inclusivity. Governments need to make sure that they involve civil societies, effective public participation, and making sure that the communities that are affected are able to be sorted out before moving forward. Um, I'd like to use an example, countries or individuals like using percentages. For instance, if we say that uh, Kenya has a coverage of 81% of our internet, so, and they're saying 96% coverage of um, internet or using the 2G. So this does not mean that the discriminated communities are part of the 96. What we are saying is even if a country has access of internet to 99%, there is still 1% which are still going to be locked out. So this 1% is, the most effective community. They're the people that we should be focusing on. They're the ones that we should make sure they are impacted with this uh, information. They are able to be included. As we are moving on, they have to make sure that communities that cannot access these services can be able to move and um, be given platforms. So other countries can use examples of Kenya, can use the litigation that we had. And we hope that other countries cannot go through the litigation process to realize the gaps that digital platform has. 
they need to just come to the government, to the community, they discuss with the communities, come up with a solution before the implementation of um, the online platform. And then lastly is they should really shy away from linking services with the digital platform because digital platform sometimes have its challenges. So if you link services with digital platforms, this means that you're locking out those who are not able to use the digital platforms. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that question of lessons learned? Um, actually, if, if that's okay, I'd like to um, come back on something that uh, you said, Yasa, because um, that reminds me this point that Mustafa made earlier about um, personal data being the new oil for the 21st century. So the other day I read this sentence and I realized this is really capturing a lot of the conversations that we have now, saying um, they, personal data is not the oil of the 21st century, but trust is. And I really like your point, Yessa, um, because this is definitely not, well, actually, according to the law that we have in the EU and now in Kenya, um, when you do a private uh, a privacy impact assessment, so the assessment I was talking about, consultation of uh, the public that is going to be impacted by it is, is a legal requirement. Um, and publication of risk assessments is also, to some degree, um, a, a legal requirement. And Honestly, I think this, this aspect is key because that's where trust is going to come from. That's where accountability is going to help people to actually have trust. And uh, that touches upon also how much, yeah, how much information is out there. How can people actually make their own um, perspective and actually hold uh, the powerful accountable? This, yeah, a lot boils down to this. Thank you. Then just lastly is um, probably we have to make sure that all these legal platforms are put into place. Um, civil societies are involved. And what we've learned from Kenya is um, we've used, the Kenyan government has stated that have, they have used close to 12 billion uh, Kenyan shillings. And these 12 billion Kenyan shillings is something that we are seeing currently it's being replaced by UPI, of which we still don't know what unique personal identify is going to look like. So other countries should learn from the money, the resources that has been used, and now it's going to be just thrown away. Instead of these issues being thrown away, we have to make sure that policies are in place, all the stakeholders are put into place, all the discriminated communities are issued with identification cards, all the resources that they need for us to be able to progress. Because 12 billion is really a lot of money. And if we are talking about um, value for money, that means that the Kenyan government has really played along in terms of using these resources. So other countries should use these examples and find out how to be able to hold their government accountable. For instance, to us, we thought that Kenyan government had only resources somewhere. And since they had money somewhere to use it, then they decided to just implement the project without coming up with assessment and risk assessments. So other countries should learn from this and make sure that they hold the government accountable and they use the rightful uh, processes to make sure that these platforms are in place. Thank you. Thank you, and and I suppose just one last um, question, perhaps before we before we go. Um, you know, we talked quite a bit about um, you know, large companies, um, often uh, headquartered in the global north, um, implementing a number of these solutions and winning contracts. Um, you know, what what is the is the best answer to this? Do, you know, is it that um, countries in the global south develop their own solutions? Or is it that um, we run fair procurement processes? What what could be done there? I think from the KM in Global South, we should implement our own projects. We should implement our own policies. We should come up with our own um, technologies. Because one of the challenges that Laurie is um, one of uh, has seen the challenges that we are facing with Idemia is uh, the information to be released. It's quite impossible and many of them, many of the responses that are saying that the issues around digitalization is only 10% based on what they're doing. So if we 
and we cannot travel abroad to go and hold them accountable. For instance, now the Edemia case, we have to use um, data rights for us to reach out to Edemia. But if we have our own localized um, technologies, it becomes easier for even you to use the company to use the communities and even the courts to hold them accountable. So these are some of the important aspects that the global South should learn from. Instead of all the data being stored abroad, for instance, I can give a, an example in 2017, uh, we were being told during the petition of uh, the presidential uh, that was canceled, we are being told that the server are being held in France and the people in France are sleeping. This is such a lame excuse that we were given. So. If all the policies and the technologies are put are remains in Kenya or in your country, then it becomes easier for us to hold them accountable so that we do not get such responses in the near future. And this is something that affects millions of people. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I, I, I know Anna wants to come in there, but I also see there's a question which Anna might actually um, be able to help answer uh, um, around talking around um, companies like Idemia. So, um, Anna. Yeah, thank you, Yasa, for what you just say. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, but I also think that it's very important to analyze like the goal, because imagine that, you know, we have a, a company in the so-called uh, Global South that is implementing uh, biometrics uh, at the border in Kenya in order to push back migrants from other like African countries. So it's also very important uh, even if this company develops biometrics and is uh, located in the global south, it's also like very important to bear always in mind uh, what are like the um, goal of the product that these companies are developing, both in the global north and in the uh, global south. And also, I think it's super important um, to see like this transnational uh, solidarity, no? What uh, Lori's organization is doing uh, with Kenya, like how like to create like this solidarity. Uh, beyond uh, borders in order to go, uh, you know, to, to um, challenge these uh, uh, companies in the global north that uh, are jeopardizing some rights. So, and, 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 just, and just before we uh, conclude, I wonder if any, any of the panelists wanted to tackle the question posed uh, in the Q&A by Martina um, around uh, Idemia and um, whether uh, this pushes us to rethink uh, a critique of the so-called migration industry. Um, any thoughts on that? I can tackle. I can tackle that. But um, so, if I understand well, Martina, you're saying that um, we have to rethink about like um, our critique towards uh, the political economy of borders because we see like. How is like governments um, investing money on on private actors, but also private actors um, going like um, behind like these countries in order to implement biometrics? I don't know if like that was the 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 question, but yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, you know while the debate uh, nowadays in um, technology is focused on uh, you know these big tech companies, um, Microsoft, Google, we saw how there are like other tech companies like Idemia. That is also jeopardizing some uh, democratic values in um, other countries, and the debate is not there. So, um, yeah, absolutely, I think that um, what we just discussed here, uh, you know, brings this back, like how we have to shift the debate and also like bring these other companies that are uh, less in this, like you know, they are like not so popular in these uh, debates, uh, critical debates about uh, technology and also like. Um, Really, like this kind of national solidarity, as I, as I say before. Perhaps a last point from Laurie before we conclude. I'm conscious of time. Um, um, same question for uh, yeah, uh, for Martina. So, I think your way of framing it is particularly relevant because in the case of Edimia, uh, the French government is actually holding shares, um, and also the um, Le Monde journalists and journalists, investigation journalists that were also uh, active in Africa, found that Edemia has been getting contracts through corruption. And so uh, I absolutely hear what you're saying. How is this showing us a different face for all these questions? And, you know, this is definitely something that at the moment I can't say is happening or not. But when I see that Edemia was told in the US that their technology was biased vis-a-vis -vis people of color, 
and then I'm, le I'm learning that they have corrupted their way through uh, countries where people uh, are not white, um, potentially to train algorithms or, you know, it raises a lot of questions on, you know, how, yeah, how these models work, how, who is actually impacted? So yeah, great question. Well, thank you, um, Laurie, and thank you um, to all of you. Thank you, Yasser. Thank you, Anna, Keegan, uh, Mustafa, who, who joined us earlier, and, and last but not least, Laurie, who helped bring this together. We'll see you soon.